today's open listening session for the draft accreditation criteria. My name is Liz Weiss, Director of Education at the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, and I'm pleased to serve as today's MC. This is the first of two sessions offered this week, sponsored by ASPPH's Accreditation and Credentialing Committee, and created to enable an opportunity for the ASPPH membership to dialogue with each other and the Council on Education for Public Health representatives on the draft accreditation criteria. I expect that ASPPH will have more such webinars over the coming year to continue engaging with members on these important issues. A few housekeeping items as we start. If you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see five handouts available for viewing or downloading. First, these draft criteria. Second, these draft template. Third, a tool on competency-based education. Fourth, these documents on how they derive their criteria and some diagrams on how to operationalize the criteria. And fifth, an illustrative mapping exercise by an ASPP subgroup, which lays out CEEF's curricular elements by the baccalaureate, MPH, and DRPH degrees, and maps them against key domains. While you are in listen-only mode and your lines have been muted, we encourage you to post questions and comments throughout the session by using the chat box located in the right-hand side of your screen. We will spend a few of the session taking your questions and comments after all of the speakers conclude their remarks. However, we opt to address quick follow-up questions after each presenter's remarks as appropriate. Our aim is to facilitate a constructive dialogue in which any critiques of the criteria also include suggestions for how to resolve the issues posed. We are recording the session and will make it available shortly afterwards on the ASPPH website. I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers today. Our CEEF counselors on the line may choose to comment or answer questions as well. And today we have with us John Finnegan, Dean of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. On to our first lead presenters. We have with us Dean Richard Kurz of the University of North Texas Health Science Center School of Public Health, and also Dean David Goff of the Colorado School of Public Health a partnership of the University of Colorado, Colorado State University, and the University of Northern Colorado. Dean Kurz is chair of the ASPPH Accreditation and Credentialing Committee through the end of this month, and our incoming interim chair, Dean Goff, will take over the committee beginning September 1st. We also have with us Dean Donna Peterson of the University of South Florida College of Public Health, Dean Peterson is ASPPH's chair-elect of our board of directors, the chair of the Framing the Future Task Force, and the president of the CEEF Board of Counselors. Also with us today are Ms. Laura Racer King, executive director of the Council on Education for Public Health, and Ms. Molly Mulvanity, deputy director of the Council on Education for Public Health. I'm pleased to turn over the floor to Rick. The floor is yours. Thanks, Liz. Um, good morning to everyone. I want to offer my own welcome to everyone who is uh, on the call today, and thank you uh, for joining us. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? The ASP ASPPH um, response has been led by the uh, accrediting committee, and I, I want to thank them for their involvement in the process. I also want to thank Liz Weiss of the uh, ASPPH staff for her leadership and support um, to all aspects of this review process that we've been conducting. Uh, it started back uh, certainly in March uh, at our ASPPH meeting when these proposed criteria were first uh, announced. Uh, when David Goff takes over uh, as chair of the accrediting and credentialing committee on September 1st. He'll be uh, carrying forward this response with the committee uh, in conjunction with the ASPPH board. Dean Goff will be talking about that um, a little later in the uh, webinar this morning. This, 
Can you go back a slide? Thank you. Uh, since uh, April, ASPPH staff has been working uh, with the volunteer groups that are listed on this slide um, who have expressed an interest in contributing to the ASPA, ASPPH uh, process and response. The upshot of each of these groups' discussions are getting posted on the ASPPH uh, online community for review by everyone who is interested in the membership. Um, I'd like to thank each of the more than 150 members of these groups who have joined the discussions uh, on these various topics, and especially those who are listed on this slide uh, as the leadership uh, for this process. We can go to the next slide now. For those who have not been involved, I, I would like to uh, briefly review what we have been doing since March. Um, as I mentioned, our initial discussion started um, in March at the ASPPH meetings. Um, next, uh, we have had the staffing of those nine groups uh, that I uh, had on the previous slide, uh, as well as the committee, of course. Uh, and they discussed and prepared responses uh, to the proposed criteria, which was uh, very helpful. Next, there have been extensive discussions at the sections retreat, which uh, occurred in June. Um, these subgroups uh, have prepared uh, extensive comments, had active discussions during the sessions, and I was very pleased to have an opportunity to participate uh, partially in those uh, discussions at the sections retreat. And I was um, excited by the degree of involvement that uh, certainly uh, was expressed. Finally, uh, at the leadership retreat, uh, the proposed criteria were discussed in a plenary session. They were also discussed at the uh, board meeting. There was substantial interest there at the process uh, for uh, the overall ASPPH response and, and its content. And um, so we will be actively engaging the board uh, as we go forward in making that response. Um, we are now at the two listening sessions, which we have begun today. This is our next step in this extensive process to be sure that we have heard directly from everyone who uh, wishes to make a comment uh, and is part of the association. That, that is our uh, desire, and we thank you, as I say, for being part of it this morning. Uh, our final slide here, if you go to that, yes, uh, indicates um, our active encouragement of you to directly uh, be involved in this uh, process. Uh, our ASP, ASPPH response is not a substitute for your institutional response or your personal comments to the commission. They are equally important. Um, one thing we would ask you to do is to please, if you make such comments, we, as we encourage you to do, to uh, send them on to Liz Weiss uh, as well so that we can uh, incorporate those into the comments that we will be sending forward as ASPPH's uh, general response. This slide indicates uh, who you can send those responses to at CEPH, uh, Laura King and uh, Molly Mulvaney, and it also indicates the uh, email address for Liz to get the comments to us. So. Um, that gives you a general overview of where we have been, and I want to, uh, again, thank everyone for participating, and I'm going to turn the webinar back over to Liz. Thank you very much, Rick. Now we'll hear from Molly Mulvanity. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a few brief comments to uh, give some context from the CEPH perspective, and then I'll look forward to uh, the discussion that's going to follow. Uh, first, I want to frame uh, our criteria revision in terms of what we're actually trying to do. And I think these principles are really helpful in thinking about um, our purpose and hopefully will help you understand a little bit about um, the method to our madness. So the principles I have there in italics, quality, flexibility and innovation, and simplicity. We also heard um, from the ASPPH membership that we want to ensure that the criteria continue to um, provide guidance for the structures uh, for schools and programs. Um, I think some important 
besides understanding our goals, uh, I think it's really important to think about the uh, larger context in which these criteria revisions are occurring. Um, there is a lot of uh, change and I would say tumult in higher education and uh, there's a lot of excitement and discussion about change in public health. I think there is mostly clarity among uh, folks across the spectrum that there is a need for change and evolution in systems and policies across higher education, um, regardless of what people think those changes uh, in systems and policies need to be. Uh, we know they need to change. Another important key, and I think this is going to come up, this theme in some of our uh, questions and discussion that are going to follow, there is a broad move in higher education at the policy level, um, sort of in national circles, and certainly in uh, public health we have our own discussion about that, on focusing uh, quality assurance and accreditation processes on assessment and outcomes. And with that comes the challenge in defining how to measure outcomes. Um, a lot of times we can agree that outputs are better than inputs, but then we struggle a little bit with how to actually capture those. Um, as I think everybody on this phone call uh, knows, there is has been a huge explosion in public health offerings and higher education at all degree levels. And across the higher education spectrum, and certainly in our world, uh, transparency is a theme that uh, consumers, uh, as well as stakeholders um, across the higher education spectrum have really um, identified as important at this time. Um, so in terms of our little world, most of you know that the last major substantive revision to the accreditation criteria was in 2005. Um, to some of us it seems like yesterday, but it's been 10 years. The other thing is that there has been a lot of good work going on in these 10 years. Um, and we're going to hear about some of the aspects from Donna uh, in the next uh, sort of presentation, but what we're trying to do in this criteria revision is to leverage the work of all of those reports, publications, and panels that have been doing good work in the past 10 years. In particular, we are very interested in learning from practice perspectives in public health. There is a criticism, I think fairly so, that sometimes accreditation criteria have not um, reflected the practice world as well as they could. Um, the other thing I kind of like to say is that we have a 10-member board of counselors um, at CEPA who make all of our uh, decisions and who are um, uh, leading these criteria revision discussions. Five of them are in schools and programs, and they are looking down the barrel of change just like many of you other uh, stakeholders are. So I think sometimes uh, that there is a vision that the council is sitting on a hill making pronouncements uh, and not thinking of the practical implication, but I want to assure you that the practical implication is always front and center uh, in our discussions. The other thing that's really important to know is that we have been tracking issues, comments, concerns, feedback, complaints of, of all sorts for the last 10 years. And we have been listening. And so the, the goals that I presented earlier, they are all in response to feedback. But the simplification goal is definitely directly related to the feedback we've received. Uh, there is no reason to make the accreditation process more complicated than it needs to be. So as we face uh, this criteria revision process and look at the three sort of themes or goals that I mentioned in the first slide, um, we face a balancing act. And, you know, I, I sort of want to highlight some of the challenges that we all face together. And we're looking forward to your feedback in how we can uh, best address these challenges as we balance them. So one thing that we hear a lot, actually, um, and this may surprise some of you, um, is that the criteria should be simpler. The problem is that complex uh, a, more comp a more simple set of criteria really doesn't take into account the great variation. And um, it would be very simple to list, um, you know, if we wrote criteria that simply told you what classes you had to teach and <laughs> exactly what they would be and exactly what the qualifications of the individuals teaching them would be, and um, that would be a very simple set of criteria. There wouldn't be a lot of confusion about interpretation. Clearly that would inhibit our desire to foster flexibility and innovation. Quality um, is, is a major concern, and we're constantly balancing the desire to make criteria clear and simple and that reporting burden reduce while still measuring, while still ensuring that we do what we're trying to set out to do at the beginning of the, and end of the day, which is quality assurance. And then I think that 
flexibility and innovation are something that many of you on the line have told us that you really want uh, room for. You want to uh, you want criteria that leave room for schools and programs to recognize their own missions, to serve their local constituents, to um, play to the strengths of their particularly fac particular faculty and staff complement. But with flexibility and innovation, we have to balance that with assuring a baseline of quality. So those are some of the sort of things we think about. The next slide presents another way to look at it. Uh, and this is sort of, some of you will recognize this as the classic engineering triangle that you can get uh, quality, cost, or timeliness, but not all three. I don't know that I necessarily accept the premise that we can't get all three, but as the last slide showed, it's a balancing act. Um, so what's next in the process? Right now, we're in comment period one. And comment period one ends in September. That's why we're all here today to talk about uh, the process and um, content of, of, con of our first comment period. Um, however, in November, we're going to push out a new product. And it will be new, improved curricular criteria that reflect all of the input you've given us in comment period one. We're also going to release the full set of criteria that address all of the domains that you see there. And in November, we're going to open comment period two. Um, as you can see here, comment period two is only potentially halfway through our process. So uh, I think there's a lot of interest and perhaps some anxiety right now with the uh, materials that are out, again, facing down the barrel of change. But uh, this is the beginning of a lengthy process that is going to be iterative and is going to involve a lot of discussion and feedback. And the only way that we will get there to our, uh, to our next set of revised criteria is through process and through dialogue. And that's what we look forward to today. Thank you very much, Molly, for that excellent explanation. Really helpful. Next up is Donna. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, uh, Molly. Thanks, Rick. Thanks to all of you who are on the line. This is a very exciting time for us in public health and in higher ed. And as Molly has just said, it's really all about how we come together and discuss these things and come out with the best process that enables us to assure quality while allowing schools to be flexible and um, not uh, increase the reporting burden, which we are absolutely committed to doing. If I could have the next slide, please. So I just want to remind people where a lot of this um, discussion started, and it started even before we created uh, the task force. But the task force um, was created um, in 2011, and really in response to the recognition that we were coming up, up to the 100th anniversary of the Welsh Rose Report. And I think all of us on the call would acknowledge that things have changed dramatically in our world since, since that time. Um, and that it's a, it's a good opportunity to really rethink the future of public health and our role as, as the academic part of that, of that field. Can I have the next slide, please? I always remind people that um, Barb Reimer suggested at our first meeting that we should take an empty room approach. And I, I always show this slide because I want to remind people that the task force certainly worked very hard to take this approach, meaning we didn't just look at what we had and make changes around the margins. We, we really stepped back and took a fresh look at how do we educate professionals for our field, how do we educate the scholars that will educate the professionals, and uh, all of the conversations that we had were undertaken in the spirit of taking a, a very fresh look, taking an empty room approach. Can I have the next slide, please? So our approach, as I said, was to be as inclusive as possible, to um, foster dialogue and conversation anywhere and everywhere we could. The task force itself started um, with a smaller number of people, and as people asked to be added to the task force, we said sure. So it, at, at the end, it was, a, it was a large task force. The six expert panels that were convened to address the specific topics that the task force um, um, said were important uh, collectively had um, over 100 people on the panels themselves. And every single report, um, not just the final report, but multiple draft reports were reviewed by hundreds and hundreds of, of people throughout the, the process. Our work was informed at a very um, high, uh, high level by a group of an employer panel. These people were 
each um, each interviewed and their comments. Um, I'll show you in a moment how um, a group of employers view the public health field and how we are preparing professionals comported extremely well with what we what we heard when we traveled around the country. Um, I or other members of the task force presented at professional meetings. These were meetings where we submitted abstracts. And then I went wherever I was asked to come to host a town hall. So we have a nice mix of both places where I was invited to come and engage in conversations and those where, um, if you will, I, I invited myself. Um, we, we, we put up a website that we updated um, all along the way. We posted a blog where we, uh, we raised questions that people responded to. And then over the three and a half years of the task force, at every ASPPH meeting, there was time for the conversation to continue to unfold. Can I have the next slide, please? This just shows you uh, where we traveled around the country to engage people in, in, in these conversations. And if you think about it, at the at the early the early part of the work of the task force, the conversations were wide open. We were we were taking a true em empty room approach. And you should know that I was invited not only by accredited schools and programs, but I was invited by um, state health departments, by the um, APHA groups in in states, and even the schools and programs. Most of the time, invited their colleagues from uh, from their practice partners. So we had rich discussions about, about the future and then as time wore on and as, as the expert panel started producing their work, I could bring those reports back. We could, we could reflect on what the expert panel had suggested and then I could continue to get um, input on, on the next round of, of panels. And I'll tell you, I'm still traveling. Um, if anyone would like me to come, I'm happy to come because to me it's always been about the conversations. We talk about this stuff at the national level, and it's important that we do, but the action and the change uh, will really have to take place in, in each of our schools and our programs. And I can tell you, these 50 plus conversations were all very enthusiastic, very excited, people were very creative, and a lot of the input into the expert panels came from these conversations. Can I have the next slide? And just to end, um, we are at this point, uh, we're done framing the future and, and we changed the logo so you can see things exploding out of the frame because it's now up to us collectively and as I said, each of us to uh, decide how that future will continue to be framed. If I can have the last slide. Um, as Liz mentioned earlier, this is, a, this is on the right under the handouts. This is a, just a, a very um, clear table, I think, that Steve put together. On the left are the draft skill um, sets that you see in the, in, the, in, the, in the current criteria that's out for revision. And then you see all of these other groups and what they suggested the core content of, of the MPH should look like. Uh, you have um, a practice panel next. You have the employers panel after that. You have um, the expert panel from the Framing the Future Task Force MPH report. And then you have the job task analysis that was recently completed by the NBPHE. And if you look across this, you can see a lot of congruence and a lot of the same kinds of ideas and the same kinds of thoughts. And this absolutely reflects what I heard in those 50 plus town halls, meetings, conferences, discussion groups over a four-year period. Um, and so when you look at the C criteria, you can see where this came from. And the fact that we've all participated in this up till now is encouraging and important that we continue to keep participating in the conversation. Thanks, Liz. That's all for me. Thank you very much, Donna, for that great background and for making these connections for us. Please, uh, those on the line, feel free to start submitting questions now as we move on to our next uh, formal speaker. David Goff will be our anchor for the formal remarks. The mic's yours, David. Uh, thank you, Liz. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, next slide, please. I, I want to add my thanks to those of Rick and others, for, to all of you for joining us on the call today. I'd also like to add my thanks to the Accreditation and Credentialing Committee for all their hard work, Liz Weiss and the ASPP8 staff, Molly and our colleagues at SEEF, and Donna Peterson and everyone who participated in the Framing the Future uh, effort, especially Rick Kurz who has led us ably to this point, leaving some big shoes to fill. I look forward to working with all of you and others. Uh, to move this process forward as per the information on this slide. 
uh, you'll see that the first task for us to complete later this month is to organize the comments that we get from this session and the session later this week. Uh, and then after drafting a response to ASPP to SEEF, we'll circulate that draft to various stakeholder groups within the organization, uh, the Accreditation and Credentialing Committee, a focus group with, that represents a slightly broader uh, or a different broader group of members, uh, and then the deans of the schools and primary program representatives who would like to have a, a look at the draft response before it is submitted. We have a pretty tight timeline uh, to get this report in by September 18th, and so we'll be asking everyone to prioritize getting their comments back. But I think it's important to remember what has been said a couple times already. This is just the first round of input. And so if um, travel obligations or other things uh, keep people from providing detailed comments at this point, uh, we may be able to um, incorporate those comments in round two or three or even round four. Uh, obviously, sooner is better uh, to get major comments back in to see. If. Next slide, please. We're getting close to the point of opening up um, this session to questions, and these are some of the issues that we've heard so far in listening to the, the various groups that have already reviewed the draft criteria and provided feedback. Uh, these are some of the, the basic messages. First is that we've heard a lot of support for raising the bar on um, academic public health education and for advancing our field. Uh, we are, after all, talking about training a workforce that with skills that they will need 5, 10, 15 years from now. Uh, and so changing the way we do things while painful may be necessary. Some of the things that we've also heard that are listed here as framing issues have to do with um, the uh, elaboration and the criteria of specific knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are part of the draft criteria as opposed to the previous approach of allowing institutions to select competency models of their own choosing. And so we'd like to hear some comment on that issue, as well as how to best connect learning in the five core areas of public health with the more integrated approach that is promoted in the draft criteria. Toward that end, you might be interested particularly in the um, uh, the fourth handout uh, that is listed in the side panel that shows how um, you might link the current criteria to, um, uh, to the five core areas of public health. There's also been some discussion of a, an apparent loss of the public health identity in the criteria. That same handout might be helpful, as might the handout that Donna Peterson just showed you. Another issue that has come up is the um, ability to distinguish the different degrees from one another, especially the MPH and the DRPH. So we, we look forward to your comments in that area. And then the, um, the idea of enabling flexibility and specificity uh, in the criteria, how well we can provide flexibility to the schools uh, while maintaining specificity in the criteria so that um, people know exactly what the criteria mean. Another large overarching issue that has come up in discussion is the burden of the documentation that people see in the criteria and how well those um, the material that's required for collection will actually document um, quality. We obviously want to assure quality in our teaching and in our students' learning, uh, and we want flexibility balanced uh, against the burden of data collection that assures that quality. Um, you heard Molly talk about this a bit in her presentation. Uh, we look forward to your comments in that area. And, and a final big thing that has come up is um, uh, some discussions around the integrative and practice uh, experiences of the students and the uh, products that might be uh, required for documentation purposes to um, document the quality of the integrative and practice experiences. We look forward to your comments there as well. Uh, with that, I think it's um, time to go to the questions. So please type your questions into the chat box and we'll get to them as best we can. We have some questions uh, that we're planning to address already based on 
things that were submitted previously. And I believe that goes back to Liz. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for that excellent update. So right, please continue submitting questions. I see some coming in. During the registration process, we invited your questions. We received a couple that way. So we're going to go to the first one, which I'm very glad to point out is the one that we've gotten more than any other question and comment. And here it is. How do skills align with competencies in the new framework? And I'd like to take the first stab at framing some of the background on this issue using a tool on the ASPPH website. You'll see the link down at the bottom that a number of members have referenced in trying to understand what these attempting to achieve in the new criteria. So competencies, no more colloquially as behaviors or abilities. They fall into three categories. The cognitive, or sometimes called the knowledge domain. The psychomotor, or the skill domain. And the affective, or the attitudinal domain. These abilities are also known as KSA, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. As mentioned earlier, competency-based learning pushes faculty to focus less on what we teach and more on what our students gain. Our approach in this method is to enable our students to acquire demonstrable and measurable abilities. In reviewing these draft curricular criteria, the question is what are the basic abilities we could agree on for each of the degrees that we offer? That's a new change in this criteria. Schools and programs will come to the table in this new model with their own competency models. Rather, it's proposed that we all agree upon one floor. So back to the model here. All human abilities fall into these three domains, more commonly stated as know knowing, doing, and feeling. So while in school, students perform discrete given tasks to demonstrate this learning. And these tasks are the building blocks of more complex bundles of competencies that students come graduation will demonstrate in the workforce. So once they become employees, they perform more contextualized, complex tasks that enable them to fulfill a role, function, or their job. So let's look at each domain now. So first, the cognitive, or the knowledge domain. That's information, we could say, in one's head. Professors are most comfortable with this domain. We've been taught largely from this model. The knowledge domain includes abilities with facts and figures, theories and conceptual frameworks, and or metacognition. An example includes specify environmental risk assessment methods, or to use a question taken from a CPH practice exam, which of the following statements best describes an intent to treat analysis. Next, the psychomotor domain covers operations. They could be mental or physical both bodily and sensory actions, while our clinical partners learn to take a pulse or examine the oral cavity, we in public health may calculate basic epi measures or communicate an organization's mission to stakeholders or conduct a rapid disaster needs health assessment. Third, the affective domain holds our feelings and attitudes. These are mediated by thoughts, experience, and aspirations. They include our motivational dispositions, perceptions, values, and opinions. We display our attitudes to what we say and do, and also what we don't say and don't do. This domain is often misunderstood and is least appreciated among faculty. However, attitudes are powerful drivers of behavior and as such are important components of learning. Examples in public health include value lifelong learning and professional service or commit to advancing population health. Now to Molly to answer the specific question before us. Actually, uh, if you could leave the model up there. Um, what, I, what I really love, and Liz's answer was absolutely beautiful, is that this tool uh, predates our draft criteria. And actually, we weren't looking at it when we made the draft criteria. But if you look at that bottom line, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, that lines up almost uh, exactly with the framework and the criteria that is uh, skills, content, and professional disposition. So 
we very much uh, see the criteria that we've presented as lining up with what we currently call competencies. We use different words for it. And we've definitely gotten the message that that's been confusing to a lot of stakeholders. So we have heard that loud and clear. Um, I think that's uh, what I wanted to say on that. Great. Thank you, Molly. The other question that came in, and continue sending them to us, we see a few. The other one that came in during the registration process was how will the new curriculum impact the job market? And Rick is going to take that one. Thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, a couple of things we might say about that. First, uh, and perhaps most obviously, it, I think it's really too early to tell. Um, these new criteria are um, obviously uh, tie back to uh, the competency structures that we had, as you just illustrated. Uh, but it's really too early for us to tell the, you know, exactly what's going to happen with the job market. Uh, and I think another important point here to make is that uh, in uh, setting up these new criteria and doing everything that was done through the framing the future process, employers were heavily involved in that process. And so they had a lot of input into how things were uh, discussed and how they were structured and, and the, re the results that came out of the Framing the Future work, as well as other kinds of activities that were going on. Uh, the uh, job task analysis certainly is another example. So I think there has been input from employers. So I think they would anticipate that what these new criteria are going to be doing would, would reflect um, on what they would be seeking. Um, and finally, I, I think um, we might just might say that um, you know the criteria are going to be reviewed by um, the field, um, by all of us in, in academic public health. Um, we're going to carefully look at these over four set, uh, you know, four opportunities to provide input, and and if we go through that process and and amend as we go along, then I think we should probably feel at the end that you know we're providing something that. Uh, will be um, a, a, a basis for the future of um, trained employees going into all kinds of public health roles. So I'll stop there and turn it back to you, Liz. Thank you, Rick, very much. Also on the line, I would like to mention that another one of our chief counselor has joined, Iman Hakim. Dean at the University of Arizona, Melanie and Zuckerman College of Public Health. So Dean Hakeem, we're going to open your line in the event that you would like to make a comment or question. As they have come into the chat box, so thanks. We have about half a dozen here. And the next one, are the job skills in priority? order. And Molly, I'll ask you to answer that one, please. No. That's a pretty simple answer. Uh, no, the order uh, that we have the skills listed in is absolutely uh, not intentional at this point, and so we welcome any comments on whether they should be reordered. Good. Next question. I would like to see evidence-based writing specifically emphasized. I assume it is within the communication category. We must emphasize written communication, both research language and street language. Any comments on that from the discussions today? I think that's I mean, a really I might uh, say, Liz, that I, I think that is an important point that um, hopefully um, when the review of the criteria occurs, um, that is taken into account. Uh, I think uh, many of us have found that um, students coming out of large universities who uh, have not really had much opportunity to uh, communicate extensively in writing because of the size of their classes. And um, this, this uh, is something that I think we need to pay special attention to and that I've always encouraged uh, the uh, uh, commission to truly make an emphasis in the baccalaureate uh, level of things, um, as well as in the master's and the, and the doctoral level. Thank you, Rick. And in the last, I'd say, couple of years, this uh, issue of writing has come up more and more amongst the 
academic affairs section representatives, and there are a, a few schools and programs that are putting more emphasis on writing. Next question. What is the thinking around assessment of KSAs? Is CIF recommending or moving towards comprehensive exams to assess in addition to standard course assessment methods? Or will it be up to the school or program to determine how best to assess students' KSAs? So in the current draft uh, that we have out for uh, comment right now, um, we define and in, we require an integrative experience, which is sort of like what we currently call the culminating experience. We also require practical uh, application of skills. Other than that, we are not particularly pres prescriptive about the assessment methods, merely emphasizing that assessment needs to be occurring um, and sort of um, focusing the documentation that schools and programs submit around the assessments rather than, again, the input. Thank you, Molly. Here's the next question. Competency-based learning slash assessment accreditation is the focus of other accrediting bodies, such as those for schools of business and engineering. Has the committee reached out to other peer accrediting bodies to see if there are existing best practices in both integration of core courses and or assessment of various competencies and or impact on job markets? Um, I'll start again. Um, absolutely. Uh, I think there's a lot to learn from other accrediting agencies. And you know, when I mentioned uh, in my presentation that we've really been trying to leverage the work of other groups, uh, panels, publications, uh, other accrediting agencies are certainly among those uh, whose work we've reviewed. Uh, Laura, who is also on the line, is actually currently serving as the chair of uh, the professional association for accreditors called the Association of Specialized and Professional Accreditors. We go to conferences with other accreditors and uh, assessment has been a major topic at recent professional development sessions at the ASPA, that association's uh, conference. So I would say um, we are as plugged in as I think we can be uh, to what's going on in other fields, and I think there is a lot to learn from them. Good to know, Molly. Thanks. Next, and this, this question, as uh, David indicated, is, has come up uh, a bit. What is the rationale in removing public health terminology, e.g. population health, epidemiology that are integral to our branding and define our place within the professional health science spectrum. If I may turn to Donna first to frame that a little bit before turning to our Steve colleagues. Donna? Sure, Liz. So um, I think if you, again, if you trace the work of the Framing the, framing the Future Task Force and even work prior to the task force, there has been um, certainly a movement to define what we do in more perhaps um, broader conceptual terms while at the same time being um, more specific. That sounds kind of crazy. But when I traveled around the country and you saw the map, there was a great deal of um, interest, if not enthusiasm. And, sorry, I'm at home. In, in, in moving away from what have been the traditional five core, and we could even talk about where those five core came from, but well, there, a great deal of, of interest in, in moving away from those five core and in essence redefining them in ways that are more current and more, more, more oriented toward the future, toward our work with healthcare organizations, toward our work with other, with other professions. So it's not that um, there's any attempt to abandon core small c core uh, areas of our field, but rather to perhaps broaden the perspective and invite more people in. I'll stop there and let Molly or Laura weigh in. Laura, would you like to? Um, yeah, I, um, I, I'm not sure I have a lot to add to what Donna um, just stated. Um, except that you're right, the, the words don't necessarily appear but the skills and the content do. Um, and so I think we sort of um, broke down more, um, you know, what are the data management and analysis skills needed um, 
as opposed to simply calling it epidemiology and assuming that everybody thinks that that means the same thing. Um, but again, that's something I think that we're, um, we're open to taking comments about because it may be that, um, that um, having those words are important and maybe having those words in there are important to, to folks. Um, so we welcome comments about that. Thank you, Donna and Laura. Next question. What is the motivation for externally specifying the KSAs instead of allowing programs to define their own? Is it to maintain a distinction between MPH and Masters of Health Administration or other programs? So I would say uh, the latter question, is it to maintain a distinction from the MHA or other Masters programs, that is less, uh, that is less true, uh, uh, but I, I think that an important component of what we're trying to do, and actually Liz framed this pretty well in her uh, discussion on the competency model uh, slide, is that we're trying to uh, define a floor. And one of the things that Donna talked about uh, is her travels around the nation um, re uh, resulted in a lot of consensus about the skills and knowledge that public health workers or uh, public health uh, scholars of the future will need. There was a lot of consensus. And so what we're trying to do in our quality assurance function as an accrediting body is also sort of help the field with um, establishing and uh, maintaining a baseline for our identity in public health. Um, I also want to draw the distinction that we are not, um, in these draft criteria, eliminating um, the uh, expectation or uh, allowance for schools and programs to establish their own competencies. In fact, we are leaving a very open door for schools and programs to establish specific competencies on top of the baseline ones that we define. So we see this as uh, coming to greater professionalization in our field, sort of agreeing on some baseline knowledge that we can say, yes, a student trained in a CEPH accredited school or program is going to come out and have these skills and knowledge because we believe that these are important to the future of public health. If I, if I could add, Liz, that's precisely what the expert panel on the MPH said, that there should be a very consistent and common core across all accredited schools and programs, and beyond that, schools and programs should be free to design the concentrations that make sense to them. And as Laura uh, uh, you talking now, as, uh, as you just heard, it's, uh, it's probably likely that schools and programs will be asked to derive the competencies for those concentrations that they choose, but what you see in the current criteria is a way to try to establish that baseline floor that we can be assured every student with a degree from an accredited school or program has. Excellent. Thank you both. Next question. To what extent were students, including incoming students, included in the discussion? So as a matter of process, the discussions have really been at this point, um, as you've heard, uh, among our council informed by all of the possible sources of information that we can gather. One of the things that I mentioned in, uh, in my slides is that we have been keeping careful track of trends and comments and feedback that we've received over the past 10 years doing accreditation work. One of the things that happens on every site visit, as many of you know, is that the site visit team sits down and meets with current students and with alumni and community members. And I think that there's comments that site visit teams have received that have ended up in site visit team reports and that staff members, including, um, including my own experience, has brought forward to the discussions. I think the student concerns have been very, or student uh, comments and feedback have been very illuminating. So I would like to think that we have uh, reflected the information sources that we have. That said, we would absolutely love it if uh, those of you who are in schools and programs or who have contact with students would encourage your students to uh, send us comments on the accreditation criteria. Accreditation criteria can seem pretty arcane, uh, but we do think that students, uh, particularly future students and alumni, have a stake in this. So we would love to get the word out that we would like as much feedback from that particular stakeholder group as possible. Thank you, Molly. And we know at many of our schools and programs, there are some very active student organizations and strong student leaders to whom you can turn. At the end of this uh, open listening session, I'm going to highlight the online communities forum discussion board, and students are more than welcome 
to join that group and comment on the criteria. We'd, we'd love to hear their thoughts that way. Next question. Liz, if I, if I could add, there were students that really, Liz, yes. I just wanted to add, there were students at nearly every town hall meeting that I, that I uh, was invited to attend, and in almost every case when I was invited by a school or a program, there was an, a, an extra meeting a time for me to meet just with students. So student voices have been uh, in, in, in put into this entire uh, process. Excellent. Liz, um, also on that, this is Laura, we also had um, one, um, one particular school, actually, um, DRPH students um, got together and provided feedback on the draft curricular criteria, so we have that as well. And one more comment from me, now that Laura has reminded me. Uh, I have talked to at least one faculty member who was intending to do this as an exercise uh, one day in uh, one of her MPH seminars. So I thought that was a great idea. She actually said her students were very engaged. These were MPH students. Mm -hmm. So um, we would love it if there's an opportunity for others uh, to do something like that. Terrific. Very creative solution to that good question. Here's the next question. I don't understand the rationale for drawing such a close parallel between the MPH and DRPH curricula. Work done by the DRPH core competency development process and then the Framing the Future DRPH expert panel to find unique areas of competence for the DRPH degree that extend well beyond the MPH degree. Why was the DRPH forced into the MPH competency domains when issues such as practice-based research competencies defined during prior work were not highlighted in the curriculum. So the first thing that I'd say is uh, that our alignment of the content, I'm sorry, the skill domains for MPH and DRPH uh, was a result of a lot of feedback that we've gotten and a lot of what we've heard uh, in reaction to a number of the reports that have come out that folks are interested in seeing an articulation or progression from bachelor's to master's to doctoral um, and seeing sort of a building of skills and competence as we go along. That said, um, I sort of want to frame, you know, I think this is, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about the DRPH already in this sort of uh, comment period. We were intending, uh, I want to go back to that principle I discussed earlier, of defining a baseline or a floor. Uh, that's what we were intending to do with the DRPH. Um, and one thing that we've heard, and that was quite intentional, is that the DRPH uh, elements in our draft criteria are much less specific than the MPH. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, that was a decision that the council made because they wanted to recognize the fact that uh, doctoral education, including the DRPH, is highly customizable and personalizable um, at the institutional and even the individual level. So we wanted to define a floor or baseline and then say there's a lot of flexibility for you to tailor the curriculum to your institution or to the individual student as appropriate. Uh, this is uh, Rick Kurz. If I can just add a comment there, um, was on the Framing the Future Task Force for the DRPH, and, and I think as a field, uh, as a reflection of what came out of that, we, we did come up with uh, common elements that we agreed on as, as part of um, uh, an appropriate DRPH, but, but there is still a great deal of uh, flexibility in people's thinking about that. and. We as a field, I would say, have not really reached resolution um, as to what we want in our um, doctoral level degree uh, reflecting public health. Now, we obviously have PhD degrees in specific areas and whatnot, but as a doctoral degree in public health, I don't think we've reached full resolution as to, to what that should be. And um, that's an ongoing process. and and, and Reasonably so. Um, we're a very diverse field, and so I, I, I really was um, pleased that oh. CEPH took a shot at at coming uh, through uh, with a common set of elements that led from you know the across the spectrum of bachelor's to master's to doctoral. It's a beginning point, probably not an ending point um, uh, as a field, but something we need to to think about and work on. OK, 
Okay, thank you, Molly and Rick. Really, an important area that we are going to need to uh, focus on in uh, in our response. Next question relates to the DRPH again. The job skills list professionalism only for the DRPH. We feel that MPH grads need to possess this skill also. Curious why professionalism is specific to the DRPH. So actually, I think the distinction is that professionalism carries through in both the MPH and DRPH. Leadership was a domain that we defined in these draft criteria only for the DRPH. So professionalism, I think, is, is there at the master's level. Um, the, uh, the idea about not including leadership explicitly as a domain for the MPH is, um, is certainly one that was, um, I don't want to say controversial, but hotly discussed. And we would definitely um, welcome a lot of feedback. I think there's a pretty robust discussion in our field, I think it's fair to say, about what leadership means and the extent to which an MPH is a leadership degree. Um, and so we certainly hope that our criteria, as they are refined, will reflect that discussion. Again, this is Rick. This is uh, David Curry Goff. I'd just I, like to add a just a comment. Oh, Rick, you go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, Rick, you go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Uh, basically, our MPHs have been very specialized degrees in the past in the in the core areas, uh, as opposed to generalized. Some of some of the schools do have a generalized degree, often a, aimed uh, generally at the public health practice. Uh, audience who didn't have a chance to get a degree perhaps earlier in their career, uh, but those degrees are fairly generalized, may have a, a, a leadership uh, management emphasis to it uh, to some degree. But our other degrees uh, have been fairly specialized. And um, there's just, I think, uh, many of, of the faculty that I talk to would say there's only so much that you can get into a, a degree of approximately 48, uh, 50 hours, something 45 hours. Uh, and, and really, uh, if we're going to do that specialization at the master's level. So I think it, it's a, to add that in in a really full-blown kind of fashion um, would cause us to think about uh, what we wanted to do with the master's degree um, in a very intense way in terms of how specialized it was going to be as opposed to how generalized it was going to be. I'll stop. Yeah, Rick, you, you hit the points I wanted to make, I'll just indicate also that remember these are viewed as floor criteria, not ceilings. And so there's absolutely nothing to keep a program from focusing a bit more on developing advanced leadership skills in the MPH program. I certainly agree with the person who wrote the question that we want all our graduates to have good leadership skills appropriate to their level of training and to their position and we can all ex exert leadership uh, in our own ways in the things that we're um, that we're working on okay great thank you next question to what degree are the criteria outlined going to be expected to be represented in degrees other than the MPH and DRPH. So the questioner is asking about the BS, the MS, the PhD during accreditation reviews. Yeah, well, we see um, our, our uh, original release of curricular criteria um, in, I guess, uh, March of this year, February, March, uh, focused on the MPH and DRPH degrees. We released draft criteria um, more recently after our June meeting that address uh, academic degrees, that is the MS and PhD and other related degrees, and that address other degrees that might appear uh, that, that might be housed in a school of public health that's being accredited. So we wrote separate criteria for those. Um, they are fairly open-ended, and they are derived from the content. They're a subset of the content that we defined for the MPH and DRPH. Again, we're open to feedback on all of those uh, elements, but I would say um, the bachelor's in public health is pretty uh, well and clearly defined in our draft criteria. Uh, 
and the uh, academic degrees and other degrees that might be in a school of public health are less strictly defined. And again, that was an intentional decision, and we would welcome feedback on uh, folks' views on that. If I can add to that as well, um, Liz, the, um, as Molly was saying, the proposed cr um, criteria for the uh, academic degrees, for example, or other professional degrees in schools of public health, um, we have heard over the years kind of a more of a desire for specificity about what um, those uh, students should ha should be expected to cover. And in the past, it's been very, very vague and based on credit hour um, requirement. And I think what we've done here is really kind of fixed it more specifically on what what they should know in terms of knowledge. Um, and so it's less tied to credit hour requirements. So we're hoping it's a little bit easier um, for folks to, to manage those requirements in those areas. Okay, thanks Molly and Laura. The next question connects a little bit with the prior one. Criteria 1 and Criteria 15 feel highly overlapping and hard to reconcile. And just for reference, Criteria 1 is MPH foundational skills. And criteria 15 is public health content in all degrees in the unit of accreditation. Could they be consolidated? Um, I think that's a really interesting comment. And uh, we've received a couple of um, comments that we've, we, people have already submitted to us in written format that have been around the same theme. I think it's something we would consider. Uh, we were really, um, we, I know that we didn't get the uh, enumeration of skills and content uh, exactly right. I know that it's overlapping. I know that there are some themes that maybe are developed more in one area and not in the other. Um, this is a first draft, as we've said, and we kind of wanted to get it out there. It's an intriguing idea about pushing the skills and the content back together. I think one aspect of our rationale and the discussions that we had uh, when we were releasing these criteria, um, the content, we chose not to associate a verb with the content. And our current competency, uh, our current emphasis on competencies requires, in essence, a verb for every uh, for every concept. We wanted to leave the content areas a little bit more flexible rather than saying a student must be able to describe X or explain why. Um, also, because we're using the same content in this current draft for MPH and DRPH uh, students, we assumed that the content would be addressed in a more advanced level for DRPH students while remaining um, you know, based in the same, to use the word again, content areas. Um, so I think it's something we would consider, but we chose to break them apart for a fairly intentional reason to allow greater, um, going back to that principle of flexibility, uh, and uh, that was sort of the thinking behind that. Molly, I interpreted that question slightly different because um, C15 is actually the other, it's the academic degrees and the other professional degrees. Oh. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. I thought Liz said that it was uh, content. I apologize. So, so I think, and Mo Molly actually very eloquently answered the question about combining skills and um, skills and, and core content or critical content um, for the MPH RPH degrees. I think C15. It, it may be a little bit confusing, um, but it relates to the footnote. So. Um, this is public health content in all degrees in the unit of accreditation. So this would, this would, um, this is where you find the requirements that are for um, academic degrees, so the MS or the PhD, um, as well as the other professional degrees. So if you're, if the school has, um, I don't know, a professional psychology program in it or a, um, an MSW in it or something like that. That, that's what would apply here. So the only way we could really combine them together would be if we sort of put a star next to the one. I think it may be confusing to combine them together, but maybe the title is, um, is confusing in that case. Yeah, I was clearly confused um, <laughs> by that one. But yeah, they, they apply to totally different degrees. They're um, completely different requirements, but maybe we can make that clearer. Okay. Thank you both. Next question. Can you address the foundational content in the draft document 
and what is meant by substantively addressing them? Would schools' programs determine the level and depth of each content area, or does CEAF anticipate sharing more guidance here? Yeah, I think, I think that uh, was part of the question that I just unintentionally answered, um, that we chose not to define a level of assessment for the content areas, and that was um, an intentional decision to allow flexibility. Okay, next question. Are there expectations that schools and programs undergo major restructuring to accommodate the criteria? e.g. reorganization of core departments to meet the criteria? The short answer is no. Um, Donna, do you want to say anything about this? Uh, hi, I'm in the car. I had to unmute myself without killing somebody. Um, yeah, no, it's certainly not our intent at all. Um, and in fact, I think the mapping exercise that's available as a handout is a nice way of displaying how you could, within existing structures that most of us have, map um, course opportunities, learning opportunities to, to the new competencies. Having said that, though, I think we're already seeing some schools um, change the way they are, they are organized uh, in, in response to what all of this um, conversation has said about our field and where it's where it's heading. So the opportunity is certainly there for people who would like to do that, but I don't think it's required in order to meet these new proposed criteria. The, the other thing I would add there is that there's actually no requirement now um, for a certain departmental structure or anything like that. Um, school, many schools, most schools have chosen to um, organize around the five core areas, um, but we certainly have situations where schools have um, combined um, combined core areas and that doesn't impact the way that we count faculty. Um, so there's no requirement now for a certain organizational structure and there's certainly no requirement going forward for any kind of organizational structure. That is completely um, up to the school. We don't have anything to say about that. Okay, good to know. Next question. Some of these criteria seem over-specified. For example, criterion 1N says, develop a grant proposal for a public health project. Why is it grant proposal versus a project or research proposal? So that is, uh, that's a great comment. That's a helpful comment. Uh, please uh, submit it in writing so that we can remember it. Um, so. That came from something that Donna heard a lot in the Framing the Future and that we've gotten a lot in our um, site visits and in schools and programs uh, interactions with stakeholders that they share with us. CEPH grant proposal and managing grant funding has been something that uh, constantly emerges as one specific skill along with financial management. Uh, those two things have sort of stood out as, uh, as utterly specific um, skills that keep coming back to us in almost the same words, but um, the alternative wording that you suggest is certainly something that we would absolutely discuss. Okay. This next question is a follow-up on one that came a question or two ago. With regard to knowledge-based competencies, I understand CEF's desire not to specify the verb i.e. the exact competencies, but then should programs be required to specify competencies of their own in those areas? The draft criteria do not include such a requirement. That's correct. And um, again, we'd be happy to hear feedback if folks, um, if folks believe that, uh, that that is something that would ensure quality. Um, but again, that goes back to our flexibility and simplification principles. Um, we really sort of put our, um, what's the word, we put our money on uh, making you really document the skill domains very uh, specifically and uh, allowed a little bit less reporting with the content, not intending the content to be any less important. So certainly schools and programs would be free to um, establish verbs or uh, their own sort of intentional uh, competencies in those areas. 
I think the idea um, as well there was to, was that in order to do some of the skills that were specified, and as Molly said, we're asking for more documentation in terms of the skills, um, it is assumed that there would have to be some kind of content, um, uh, some sort of knowledge prior to being able to demonstrate the skill. So it's also um, sort of implied, and as Molly said in our in our attempt to make that more um, more simple, so it have less documentation for the critical content and more documentation for the skills. Um, we believe that the content is implied in being able to do the skills. The other theme that Laura just raised that I, I just wanted to pick up on is the fact, uh, the idea about our public health identity. And our public health identity is definitely uh, much more specific and uh, defined in the content than it is in the skills. And again, that's a balancing act that we've been doing. And um, there's been a lot of discussion uh, in our field and in our fellow accreditors' fields. Um, if you look at some of the skills, such as communication, that cuts across any number of professional degrees uh, or other types of degrees that we might see. So a social worker might also need to know how to manage grant or program proposals and uh, communicate effectively in writing and assess community needs. Um, but what makes us different in public health specifically is the content. Okay, thank you. Two process questions. Yes, the slides will be available uh, shortly, we hope in the next 24 hours. And how do we submit a question in writing? So just write into that same chat box where you asked how to submit a question and we'll be able to see it. We have two more questions here and we have about 19 more minutes to go, so we'll definitely be able to cover these two and more. With a possible focus on the foundational skills and content, it is conceivable that a student transcript might no longer show classes called epidemiology or biostatistics, for example. Could that pose a problem for a graduate in their job search or future academic pursuits? So echoing a theme that Laura raised earlier, um, currently we don't require courses to be titled in any particular way. And some of our schools and programs have already moved to more uh, integrated models that don't necessarily list a course as epidemiology or biostatistics. So I think um, that those schools and programs have, have not noticed any problematic effect. Um, so I would say we don't anticipate that as a worry. I don't know if any of the other uh, folks have something to add. Liz? Yes. I, I lost the call and I had to wait until I got to a red light to call back and I missed the question. What was the question? Uh, that prior question, with a possible focus on foundational skills and content, it is conceivable that a student transcript might no longer show classes called epi or biostats, for example. Could that pose a problem for a graduate in their job search or future academic pursuits? So if I could comment on that um, from when I was at UAP and we created an integrated core and this question was asked often, um, I simply wrote, uh, I wrote um, for any student who wanted it, uh, a letter that explained what the integrated core contained, the knowledge and skills uh, that students would possess, um, the way we assess their, their competency, and that was not ever a problem. And I think, you know, people could do the same thing now. And I think also when someone earns an MPH, there should be, again, if we all follow the same sort of core curriculum, there should be an implicit understanding that they possess all those, all those skills. Yeah, in some ways, I think our framework is going to allow employers, um, you know, th this proposed framework is going to, uh, might allow employers to have a better idea and students perhaps to have a better idea of what specifically uh, they can do and what specifically they learned. Um, it's more sort of enumerated. And again, we have to discuss and agree on what we think that baseline should be. But perhaps it is more informative if uh, somebody could go and look at our criteria and say, aha, I know the graduate has 
already demonstrated by graduating from the program that he or she has these particular skills and has been um, involved in this particular content, that may, be may, that may be more informative to an employer than knowing that somebody took epidemiology. I think that's true. Okay, good. Thank you. Next question. Would you please speak to the competency or criteria for faculty teaching across these programs? For instance, would nursing faculty be able to teach courses developed in the program? In other words, do all faculty have to have public health degrees to teach core courses, not electives? I am building my faculty capacity and need to know, are there limitations on who can teach in the program? So our current criteria do not uh, define uh, a specific qualification as you described. We have not yet released uh, the draft criteria on faculty qualifications, but I don't uh, anticipate that they would uh, that they would that they will um, address that in a specific manner as you're uh, as you're saying. And currently, a lot of our accredited schools and programs have individuals with a variety of academic credentials um, teaching core and elective classes. Um, what our criteria say is that the individual needs to have the appropriate training and experience. Uh, so those are two things. Training would be their um, academic background and credentials, and experience would be sort of a professional life, whether that's scholarly life or um, work outside of uh, the university structure. Okay, thank you. Next question. Will interprofessional experience be part of the criteria since other disciplines, medicine, pharmacy, nursing, for example, are requiring it and expect public health to be involved? Yeah, that is that is um, an element of our content. We did, we did list that in there. And we think a number of the skills that we've enumerated also speak to uh, interprofessional work. Um, if there are better ways of articulating that, um, We'd certainly be welcome, or we'd certainly be receptive to those content comments. Okay, great. Next one on the mapping document provided as a handout. So that's the fifth document. I'm a bit concerned that environmental health does not map to any of the domains. Also, that only the cognitive items are listed. Is this just an example mapping, or something more prescribed? So. I'll take that one. That exercise was undertaken by a small group of academic affairs representatives. And if we could please go to those slides real quick. We tag them on at the very end. Just want to show you what we're talking about here. What they did was they went to these draft curricular proposals and pulled out all the elements that uh, relate to the degrees. And this is about a five, six page document. And they pulled it from the foundational skills, the foundational content, and the professional dispositions. And they mapped them by degree, as well as by, on the far left, you'll see the proposed domains. The legend at the top there indicates also that they took a stab at marking the verb for each of the skills to show where it falls along the Bloom's taxonomy. So this is kind of an interesting way to view where the elements currently proposed fall along our, um, our various degrees and mapped against both the five traditional core areas and then a couple extra buckets where uh, the elements were beyond the five core, and that would be the foundations of public health. You see there at the top and then at the bottom some sort of a practice uh, category. So this is a, just a, a mapping exercise that uh, is meant to illustrate what we have there in the, the current criteria. And for us to see exactly as you have suggested in, this, in your question, is there anything missing? Or is it maybe a little thin? So um, and environmental health has, has come up uh, more than once as an area that some think we might need a little more coverage. Yeah, I think this goes back to uh, the balancing act that I think Rick referred to earlier, or maybe it was David, um, about the amount of content and skills that we can fit into a degree. So we're constantly sort of doing a balancing act. We would absolutely uh, welcome comments on other environmental health uh, skills or knowledge or 
uh, skills and, and knowledge that you uh, believe align with the current core area of environmental health, um, we uh, we sort of uh, had to weigh all of the content and skills um, to try to come up with a reasonable list. But we can add to the list if folks think it is very important for our field. Uh, this is David Goff. I'd like to contribute to this discussion as well. I, I, I think it would be possible and probably desirable to map some of the skills to environmental health uh, topics. I'm looking at the criteria and under data analysis issues around implementing data collection strategies. Uh, there are specific data collection strategies in environmental health sciences that would be really important to, um, you know, or that could be mapped to that particular skill, uh, you know, under communication, some of the communication issues may very well focus on environmental health issues. Um, under systems thinking, uh, environmental health uh, is an important component of our systems thinking about what the one health phenomenon and how people can't truly be healthy unless the environment that we're living in is healthy and the animals and plants that share that environment with us are healthy. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to map environmental health thinking and that's just a couple of examples. There are others and if, if you go down the list of skills where perhaps the mapping exercise uh, could be further elaborated to uh, emphasize the importance of environmental health. David, thank you. Those are excellent observations, and uh, so that map was, you know, the first stab at putting things in, you know, some buckets. And I just want to add that the the mapping exercise was not an attempt to push us back towards the old traditional five core areas, but just to, uh, as I said, illuminate what what's falling where in in, in the first step. So uh, we're pulling up here the first one of the. Uh, Schemata, schematics in the CIF, uh, CIF documents that are posted on their website. And, and Molly, would you like to speak to this one? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I, I think I was, uh, I was thinking about how David's comment relates to this. Uh, this is just a sample, uh, this sort of schemata that we prepared. Um, and so you can see there are a variety of skills that could be linked to environmental health sciences. Uh, there we, we, we uh, listed, for example, the one about teamwork, uh, the one about advocacy. Um, but I think, yes, yeah, that's, that's sort of an elaboration of the point that David just made. Thank you, Molly. And we're going to go to our last question, because that will leave us enough time to wrap up here. A number of our public health courses... Uh, before you do, I guess, this, this is David. Before you go to the last question, I guess, you know, maybe the way to to summarize that is that if someone were to keep a course identified as an environmental health sciences course, it, it would seem to me very, very um, easy to uh, demonstrate how many of these skills and our skills areas are being developed within the context of that course. Excellent. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, we'll, we'll go to that last question now. A number of our public health courses, Biostat, EPI, et cetera, are used by other academic programs as requirements that meet specific skills required by their program. Taking integrated public health courses will not meet their needs in specific areas. Will we have to create duplicate curricula? So the answer is overwhelmingly no. Um, as we've said, the, uh, the draft criteria that we've released are not intended to, to uh, define a specific set of courses that, that are either integrated or uh, sort of split the way our current five core courses are. Um, our current criteria don't dictate that, and we're trying to make the point even more strongly in the criteria going forward. So um, the other thing that I would say is that um, one thing that we are probably taking a little bit of a stand on. Uh, uh, we talked in the beginning about raising the bar in public health, and we've talked a little bit about the increasing professionalization of public health. And I think it's really important that we not um, we not sort of um, define our criteria based on what other disciplines need. Um, I think that it's really important that we continue to move forward in defining what public health uh, is and can be as we um, move into the future. 
Yeah, if this is Rick, I, again, if I could just second what Molly just said, I, I think that's extremely important. Um, these skills in uh, our back knowledge skills, whatever, in public health, I think are important to other fields. Um, and I think uh, if they recognize that, then they should be willing to uh, come to schools and programs of public health and provide the financial resources that are necessary uh, for us to uh, uh, meet their needs, which might be quite separate than um, what we want to do to train public health professionals for the future. Thank you both. And I'm going to tuck in one last question because I think it's quick and it's very important. Assuming that these criteria are adopted, when will programs be expected to comply? Yep. So whenever we adopt criteria, anytime we adopt criteria, we also adopt uh, what's called an implementation schedule. And the implementation schedule is going to be uh, is going to be defined based on uh, the specific circumstances of the criteria that we ultimately adopt. So um, you know, I mentioned that five of our ten counselors are in schools and programs and facing uh, making changes themselves. Uh, we're very sensitive to the need for uh, implementation. It's not good accreditation practice to ask somebody to, um, for instance, rewrite a self-study that they're in the middle of. That that wouldn't be good practice, nor would it be good faith. So um, we will adopt an implement. We will adopt an implementation schedule that allows what we believe is reasonable time and uh, considering all of the factors. Last time we adopted a new set of criteria that were a major revision, we had uh, a period of two calendar years before we started doing site visits uh, that were um, using those criteria. I think in this round what I've heard is that folks are eager to adopt certain elements uh, of the change, so we may be able to come up with some uh, some timelines or, or procedures for early adopters, but this is not going to be a change on the dime. We have to uh, retrain our site visitors, uh, remake all of our technical assistance materials and templates. So uh, we will certainly allow an ample time um, for implementation. Thank you, Molly. There are additional questions in the question box that we are going to make available to the speakers and, of course, to see and we will be tracking uh, any additional questions that come in before the end of the session. I'd like to turn over the microphone to the chair of our Accreditation and Credentialing Committee, Dean David Goff, for the concluding remarks. David? Uh, well, um, first I want to thank everyone for being on the call today and submitting your questions. Um, the, the, they've been wonderful, great questions. Hopefully you'll agree with me that the responses have also been very helpful uh, from our colleagues and partners on the call. Uh, we're going to carefully look at the um, questions that were raised and some that we weren't able to get to, uh, the discussion that occurred here as well as that which will happen on the upcoming listening session and we'll be incorporating this feedback into our responses to see if please continue to send your comments to ASPPH and Liz Weist. Uh, there is the online community for the accreditation review group. Information is going to be on the next slide. Please join that online community uh, and please remember that there will be other opportunities for us to continue to give feedback to see if, as the process moves forward. So thank you very much. Next slide. Um, and this one may be Liz's to cover so that she can provide me additional detail. Thank you so much, David. Yes, just send me an email if you'd like to join this discussion group. About 200 of you are already in it. We have posted, I think, about half a dozen of the preliminary reports of those subgroups that Rick listed at the beginning of the call who are working to discuss amongst themselves and circulate drafts of their initial responses. And we've had some comments going back and forth. It's, it's very helpful, I hope, um, to you all and extremely helpful to the um, ASPPH leadership in seeing where the reactions are to what's on the table right now. So just send me an email to join. And the um, questioner asking about students, please, by all means. This is for our membership, faculty, staff, students, and alumni. And the next slide. So thank you, thank you so much. We have heard your comments. We uh, really appreciate your taking the time to focus on this really important issue. Tell your colleagues that there's one more listening session 
it's going to take place Thursday, August 20th uh, in the afternoon. And for the archive webinar, see the event uh, webpage on our website in the next 24 hours or so, and you could listen through it and uh, circulate that with your colleagues as well. So again, thank you, and this concludes, unless there are any closing remarks from, we do have just a minute, from any of our speakers. If you have any closing comments, I invite you to bring them forth at this time. Okay, again, we're very grateful to our speakers, Rick, Donna, Molly, Laura, and David, and to our SEED counselors, John Finnegan and Aman Hakim, who also were able to join us on the line. Thank you very much. This concludes our first open listening session. <laughs>